So next we have Ben Moll, my colleague here at Princeton. He's, um, he's an expert on modeling uh, wealth and income distributions, and that's exactly what he's going to talk about now. Okay. Um, thanks to Atif for organizing this great conference and for putting our paper on the program. So this is uh, joint work with uh, Xavier Gabex and Jean-Michel Lazry and Pierre-Louis Lyon, so more French people, I guess. Um, and I should say it's quite preliminary. Um, so in the US, um, the past 40 years have uh, seen a rapid rise in um, top income inequality and arguably also in top wealth inequality, which uh, Gabrielle just talked about. Um, so here's some graphs uh, to show you this, which are based on work by Piketty, Saez, and Gabriel, and some co-authors. So for example, um, on the left-hand side, I'm plotting the uh, top 1% um, income share over time. And you can see that in 1980, the top 1% income share was uh, approximately 8%. And uh, nowadays, it's almost 20%, so a massive increase in the top 1% income share. Um, on the right hand side is a similar graph for wealth, um, so the top 1% wealth share. I would say the first thing uh, to note for wealth is that the facts are a lot murkier um, because the data is a lot worse. Um, so what I'm showing you here is sort of two data series. Um, so the first one in solid is the survey of consumer finances, um, and that suggests a sort of relatively gradual rise um, in top wealth inequality here from the top 1% wealth share going from, say, 27% to 34% today. And the other line I'm showing you is this data series from the paper that Gabrielle just presented um, here for the top 1% wealth share, which suggests a much more dramatic rise in top wealth inequality. Um, either way, I would say sort of the obvious question um, when you look at these graphs is sort of why. So why has top labor income inequality increased so rapidly? and uh, maybe also top wealth inequality. Um, so I told you this is sort of about top inequality. So let's take a step back and think about what we know about top inequality. And I would sort of say that really one of the main things that we know about top inequality sort of since 1896 um, is that the upper tails of the income and wealth distribution follow uh, power laws. Okay? And another way of saying the same thing is that sort of top inequality is fractal. What I mean by that is that statements of the uh, sort here on the slide hold. So the top 0.01% are some number x times richer than the top 0.1%, who in turn are some number x times richer than the top 1%, and so on. Okay? And where the important thing is that this x here is a fixed number that doesn't change where you go in the, in the distribution. You can make a similar statement in, in terms of relative shares. Okay? Um, let's have a look at what this looks like in the data. So this is for income, and what I'm plotting here is these sort of relative income shares. Okay? And the uh, red line is the uh, income share of the top 0.1% relative to the income share of the top 1%. And the blue line is um, the top 1% income share relative to the um, top 10% income share. If these things followed, uh, if, if the upper tail of the income distribution followed an exact power law, then these two lines should be exactly on top of each other. And you can see that uh, they're not exactly on top of each other, but they're pretty close, OK? And the other thing you can see in this graph, and that's really the main important thing that I wanted, want you to take away from this graph, is that these two lines are upward sloping, OK? Which is to say that not only have the top 0.1% uh, gotten richer over time, but they've also gotten richer relative to the top 1%, OK? And that's really the striking uh, fact here, OK? In the paper, we also do a similar exercise for wealth, and I'm, I'm not going to show you that here. Okay, so here's sort of what we do in this paper. Um, so our starting point is um, existing theories that can uh, explain top inequality at a point in time in the sense that they can generate income or wealth distributions that have uh, a power, follow a power law in the right tail. Okay? There's a bunch of different economic stories out there. So for what exactly uh, determines top income or wealth inequality? Um, but at some sort of a meta-theoretical level, they all look very similar. Okay. In particular, they're all based um, on some sort of a random growth mechanism. I'll tell you exactly what I, by, what I mean by that. Okay. And so, for example, for wealth, this could be something like uh, Gabrielle sort of talked about this a bit, um, that different people have different returns on their wealth, and those fluctuate stochastically. Okay. Um, the question we're ultimately after is sort of which of these specific economic stories that can explain um, top inequality at a point in time can also 
explain the observed dynamics of top inequality that I've shown you in the, in, in the previous slides. Okay? So some people, for example, say that in, in the case of income inequality, it's all due to falling cap, uh, income taxes, labor income taxes, and others say that it's mostly due to some sort of superstar effect, so managers getting compensated more. And we're sort of going to try to tell these sort of stories apart. Um, similarly, for wealth, some people say um, the increase in top wealth inequality is all due to falling capital income taxes, so what Piketty would call a rise in R minus G, okay? And we're going to try to ask sort of how reasonable is that. And, and to get at this, here's what we do. So we study um, transition dynamics, um, so the evolution of the distribution of the cross-sectional distribution of income and or wealth in a sort of big class of theories um, that, that have this sort of a random growth mechanism that you need to get a, a right tail that follows a, a power law. Okay. We're then going to contrast the transition dynamics in this model to the transition dynamics that you see in the data, so these time pass for top income and wealth shares that I've shown you before, we're going to use that to sort of rule out some economic stories and to sort of rule in others. Okay. So here are our main results. Um, so the first main result is that um, transition dynamics um, of uh, the sort of standard random growth model, which is really what all of the existing literature on top income and wealth inequality is built on, are an order of magnitude too slow relative to what you see in the data, okay? Um, and in particular, we're gonna have this sort of a nice analytic formula for the speed of convergence of the distribution, and it turns out that if you take some uh, reasonable parameter values and you plug those in to this formula, you get that the transition is very slow, okay? Um, on top of that, the uh, transition turns out to be even slower or particularly slow in the part of the distribution which we really care about which is the upper tail of the distribution when we, if we want to understand these, these trends here, okay? Um, so given this result, we then ask, um, so what then can deliver, what, what can deliver fast transitions in, from a theoretical point of view? And um, I'm going to argue that to get fast transitions, it really requires quite specific departures from sort of the standard models that people typically talk about, okay? And this is really the main result that's going to be useful in terms of the economics here. Because okay. um, it's going to turn out that only sort of very particular economic stories can generate these departures um, in, in these sort of uh, random, from these sort of standard random growth models. And we're get, then going to be able to use this result to sort of rule out, so eliminate a bunch of uh, economic stories here. Okay. So the idea is that sort of there's a bunch of uh, stories for the potential determinants of top income and wealth inequality out there, and we're going to use our results to sort of uh, eliminate a, a certain fraction of those, say half, okay? So here are our findings. Um, so we're going to argue that uh, the rise in top income inequality um, is probably not due to uh, at least simple versions of tax stories, okay? And we're also going to argue that stories about uh, the variance of permanent earnings increasing, which some people have told, are also not going to cut it, okay? Instead, um, what has a potential of uh, explaining the increase in top income inequality, for example, are these sort of superstar stories and or sort of more complicated tax stories. Similarly, for um, wealth inequality, um, we're going to argue that sort of the, uh, the simple sort of R minus G um, Piketty story, so uh, falling capital taxes, for example, is not going to cut it either, okay? because that's going to give way too slow transitions. And instead, uh, what, you, what you need, for example, is something like that the, the, the rise, uh, that, that the savings rates or the rates of returns of the super wealthy relative to the rest of the population increase. So kind of uh, consistent with what Gabriel showed us some evidence for at the end of his talk. Okay. Let me just very, very briefly talk about sort of the related literature here. So the uh, point is that there's a, a bunch of papers out there, a long list, um, going back to the 1950s, um, where people use these sort of random growth uh, theories to think about top inequality. And I, I thought it'd be sort of fun to just single out one particular paper, this paper by uh, uh, Piketty that he gave at the um, AEA meetings, so the meetings <coughs> of the American Economic Associations in, in January, where he really went out of his way to sort of argue that these random growth type models are the right way to think about this whole R minus G business. Okay, so this is exactly um, um, in, this, in this literature. Um, the broader point, however, is that sort of all of these uh, papers here that I'm listing here, they sort of are about um, 
top inequality at a point in time. So they study stationary distributions. What we bring to the to the table is a study of the transition dynamics, so really the evolution of inequality rather than inequality at a point in time. Okay. Um, so here's the plan for my for the rest of my talk. So I'm going to show you uh, a bit of theory, and it's really going to be sort of the the simplest possible theory of top income inequality that I can think about. Okay. Um, I'm going to first study, like, show you some some properties of the stationary. Um, top income distribution, and then I'm going to study transition dynamics, which is really the new stuff here, okay? Um, and then, that's going to be really the more interesting part, I think, or the most interesting part, we're going to try to use these results to ask so which of the specific economic theories that we, uh, that we, that we sort of can think about can have the uh, potential to explain the observed uh, dynamics of top inequality, okay? In today's presentation, due to time constraints, I'm mainly going to focus on a top income inequality. Um, in the paper, we do a sort of an analogous exercise for top wealth inequality. In the end, if I still have some time, I'm, I'm going to talk about top wealth inequality maybe hopefully a bit. I think it's interesting to uh, connect it to the results that, that uh, Gabriel talked about. OK. So here's, um, and that's going to be really the main sort of model or, th or theory part here. Here's sort of the simplest possible uh, theory of top income inequality that. I, I, I sort of could write down, okay? So there's, um, time is continuous here. Um, there's a continuum of workers. Um, they're heterogeneous in uh, something like their human capital, so their productivity. Um, they ri die or retire at some rate. Um, delta here, that's a parameter. Um, and they're replaced by some, if they re retire by some young labor force entrance with some initial human capital. Their wage is just, um, some skill price times the human capital, so it's proportional. So your human capital determines your wage. And then we're going to assume that human capital accumulation um, involves two elements that are important. So one is investment, so you can go to school more or, or learn more on the job. And then there's also going to be some element of luck. Okay? Um, if I'm not going to show you the details here, but it's going to turn out sort of if you make sort of the right assumptions here, you can uh, get that the the evolution of wages follows uh, this equation here on the slide, which is that the growth rate of the wage is stochastic. Okay, and what it says in words is that the um, over a short time interval here dt, the growth rate is um, some average growth rate, which here is denoted by gamma bar, plus um, some parameter sigma, which is something like a variance, times um, dz, which is a standard Brownian motion, which is really just to say that it's a, a normally distributed random variable. Um, so there's th that's the stochastic component. Okay. And here I sort of set it up in terms of a model of human capital accumulation, but I want to point out that sort of a number of alternative theories, I think, lead to a very similar reduced form. So it doesn't necessarily have to be about human capital, as long as you have this element of luck in there. That's what's important. Let me tell you what the stationary distributions here look like. So the inequality at a point in time um, after it's sort of played out. So the result is that um, the stationary uh, income distribution here has a Pareto tail, um, which is to say that in a graph it looks like this, so it has this sort of a fat uh, uh, right tail of the d distribution. Um, and because it's sort of hard to see how fat the tail is here, I'm going to sometimes show you uh, plots sort of on a log-log scale, so like on the right. And in which case a Pareto distribution just comes sort of a a downward sloping line. So then what you need to look at is sort of how steep this line is and the flatter line uh, corresponds to a fatter tail. Okay? Um, and it turns out you can characterize the sort of fatness of this tail uh, very precisely. So here it's going to be sort of a solution to a simple equation and it's going to turn out sort of that top inequality which is sort of the inverse of the slope of this line here um, is a solution to a quadratic equation and it's increasing um, and it's quite intuitive in, in the average growth rate of wages it's increasing in how much noise there is or how much luck there is in human capital accumulation, so this sort of variance, and it's decreasing in how quickly people retire because then they don't have uh, enough of a long enough lifespan to, in to accumulate a lot of uh, income here. Okay. So here's, here's, here's sort of the main thing we're gonna study. So um, think about the following experiment. So think about the experiment that for some reason um, this parameter sigma in this model, which is sort of uh, how much luck there is in, in, in earnings um, accumulation, goes up. Okay, so this, it's sort of the variance of permanent earnings, if you want. Um, 
from what I've shown you before, you already know that that's going to lead to an increase in stationary tail inequality. Okay? Um, but the big question is sort of what about the dynamics? Okay? And the thought experiment here is, is going to be that sort of suppose you're in a steady state where the distribution has a Pareto tail, so it has an upper tail which looked like before. Um, so on a log log scale, it looks like this. But then um, sigma goes up, so you know that in the long run you go to higher top inequality, you go from the blue line to the black line. But the question is sort of how fast do you go there? Okay? And the other question is sort of um, where does the distribution move first? So does it move first um, sort of for low income groups or does it move first for sort of higher income groups? Okay? And that's kind of what we're going to study. Okay? So here's our first main result. And this is about the average speed of convergence of, of, of this distribution. Um, and th the proposition is that the cross-sectional distribution here, it's an, in terms of log income, um, which I called x, um, converges to uh, uh, its stationary distribution exponentially at some rate that you can uh, characterize quite tightly. And it's this formula here. Um, and it's going to turn out, and that's really the main thing that's useful, that um, for if you fix a given amount of top in income inequality, so this parameter eta, which I had on the previous slide, um, and you think about how does the speed of convergence vary with a bunch of uh, parameters that has this, these, um, these properties here. So in particular, speed of convergence is going to be slower the higher is top inequality, okay? And it's going to be faster the more sort of um, um, noise there is, so the, more, um, the bigger are the shocks that hit people. And it's going to be faster the faster people sort of die or retire. Okay? So the important observations here is that high inequality um, sort of goes hand in hand with very slow transitions here. This is like what, what one, one thing that really comes out of this theory immediately. And that's going to be the key thing or one of the key things that's going to uh, tell you that sort of these theories are, are not going to be able to deliver these, these, these fast transitions. Okay? Um, another thing that's sort of useful is that this and uh, the speed of convergence is sort of exponential, so, you, so it tells you that, um, th that you can think about um, the inverse of that as sort of a half-life, okay? So you can think about what, how many years does it take for the distribution to go to its new stationary distribution, okay? And that's going to be useful because you can, um, it g allows you to give quite precise quantitative predictions, okay? The, the result on the previous slide was sort of uh, for, uh, as a, for a measure of the average speed of convergence of this distribution. But what we really care about is um, the upper tail of the distribution, because we want to think about top, the top 1% or top 0.1% income share, in particular those relative to each other. Okay. Um, so in the paper, I'm not going to uh, sort of show you all the technical details. We sort of have a full characterization of all the uh, moments of, the, of this distribution. And the main takeaway from this part is that transitions can be much slower in the upper tail, okay? And the uh, main point here is really you can see in this graph here. So the, the thought experiment is you start out um, at a distribution that's the blue line, okay? And you end up at a distribution that's the purple line. Um, and the question is how do you go there? And the main point here is that sort of for the first few years, um, the distribution sort of shifts out in parallel rather than sort of rotating, which would be to say that the the tail gets fatter. So for the first few years, the tail actually doesn't get fatter. Okay, so the, the top 0.1% doesn't actually get richer relative to the top 1%. They, they get fatter in parallel rather than relative to each other. Okay, and that's going to be important also. Okay. So now this was the theory. So now I'm going to um, show you some, uh, uh, connect this back to the data that we saw in the introduction. Okay. Um, so here this is just restating um, this process for, for wages that we had before. Um, and then there's the sort of parameter at sigma, which is the variance of uh, uh, permanent earnings. Okay. And there's, a, uh, there's some literature out there that has argued that this parameter sigma, which is the variance of these permanent earnings, has increased over the last 40 years. So here's some refer references that, 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 uh, that argue that. Okay. Um, Fatih may talk about this a little bit because he actually has a sort of dissenting paper, um, but I don't want to get into that. I'm going to just ask, suppose this has increased. Um, Canada actually uh, explained the increase in top in income inequality. Okay? And here's what this looks like. So on the left hand side is the graph I had in the very first slide of the um, introduction. And um, on the right hand side is some measure of the fatness of the tail of, these, uh, of this distribution. Okay? And the blue line is just the data which I had in the introduction. And the green line 
is what you get in the model if you parameterize this somehow, okay? I'm not gonna show you the exact details. The point here is that the model sort of fails miserably, okay? So just cannot uh, at all get this fast increase in top income inequality, okay? So this story is sort of out the window. Um, so then, uh, given that, so the question is what drives top in income inequality then, okay? And we've sort of, uh, and here's where it gets a bit more preliminary, but we sort of thought about a bunch of different candidates, and it's really quite hard to get this fast increase in top income inequality, okay? And our leading example, which I'm gonna show you in a second, is something about um, heterogeneity in mean growth rates, which wasn't there in the, in, the, in the previous example. I'll show you exactly what I have to do. We also have some other things in the paper, but I'm not gonna talk about that here. Okay, so here's what I mean by heterogeneity in, 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 in mean growth rates. Uh, so this is motivated, here's a nice graph from a paper that sort of motivated this exercise, which is actually by our discussant Fati and Greg Kaplan, who's also here at Princeton. Um, so this is uh, age earnings profiles for a bunch of different uh, groups in the uh, income distribution, okay? This is split by lifetime income. Okay, and what you see here is that, so on the x-axis is age, on the y-axis is uh, sort of uh, their wage in, in, or earnings in, uh, in thousands of dollars. And the, the main point here is that sort of the, the black line, which is the top 0.1% of the distribution, grows much, much faster than uh, the rest of the distribution. And the, the numbers are really massive here, okay? So if you just sort of eyeball this, you basically get that the top 0.1% of the, of the lifetime income distribution grow by, on average, 25% each year, okay? So two years, 50%. So this is just like massive growth. And whereas for lower parts of the income distribution, this growth is much, much slower. Okay? So it's something like 3% per year for the bottom 99 of the distribution. And that's kind of something gonna, it's gonna be something that we wanna capture in this theory, which wasn't there in the previous one. Okay? So I'm gonna actually uh, skip how exactly we model this. The point is just we're gonna have sort of two groups and some are gonna grow faster than others. Okay? Um, the experiment we're gonna do then is we're gonna say, um, suppose that um, this, this, so the idea, I guess, so let me say it in words again. So the idea is, I guess, that a part of the population is sort of on a fast track, okay? So they experience, every now and then, they experience this really fast income growth, and that's really what, what puts them in the top of the income distribution, okay? I'll, I'll give you some interpretations of this in a second. Um, um, so on the left is again, so th this is the same two graphs as before, and the experiment we're doing now is, uh, we're, we're taking the part of the distribution that's sort of in the high growth regime and we're giving them a, 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 a higher growth rate, okay? And the point is that if you do this experiment in contrast to the model before, which failed sort of miserably, you can actually nail uh, the evolution of the top 1% uh, labor income share, okay? Um, okay? There's a question about is there actually any sort of solid empirical evidence for this type of story? Um, maybe Fatih is gonna talk about this. Um, here's just a few um, candidate economic explanations for this and what could give you something like this. So this is sort of what you need in terms of the theory. The question is sort of what, what actually drives it. Um, so the idea would be that sort of these different growth regimes could be something like different occupations. So maybe some guys are in the finance industry or the IT industry and they just have much faster earnings growth than other people. Okay, that could uh, give you something like this. Um, also some sort of superstar story um, could give you this. I'm not gonna talk about this too much more because I wanna briefly get to the wealth inequality part because I do still have a few minutes, okay? So now we're sort of redoing a similar exercise <coughs> but for top wealth inequality, okay? And it's sort of a similar type of model and it's sort of the simplest uh, possible model of the tops of the uh, wealth distribution that you can think about. And uh, so it kind of has a similar com flavor and in particular it has the flavor that the growth rate of your wealth is going to be stochastic. Why? Because the rate of return on your wealth is stochastic. Okay? Or maybe it could also be the savings rate. Uh, you have a savings rate which fluctuates. Different people have different savings rates. So I would also give it to you. Um, the important thing if you look at these equations here, it's going to turn out that if you do this correctly, you're going to have this sort of a term R minus D floating around in here, which is sort of the Piketty term if you want, um, where R is the after-tax average rate of return and G is the growth rate of the economy. Okay? And um, you can show that sort of the stationary income distribution, so the income distribution if you let the economy run for a very long time, is uh, 
has a top tail inequality exponent which looks like this, and if you just sort of stare at this equation for long enough, you're going to see that it's actually increasing in r minus g. Okay, so the higher is r minus g, the higher is top uh, stationary tail inequality. Okay, so this is exactly sort of uh, the the picketty point, if you want, uh, and it's also like a very steeply increasing function. Okay, um, the question though is sort of can this increase in r minus g actually explain the observed dynamics, not just the stationary inequality that you see in the data? Um, so we did a little experiment. So we took some we tried we took some measures of like r minus g from the data. Um, I'm going to go fast here. So we took in in this version we took uh, rates of returns from um, a paper by Gabriel and Piketty, and we took some uh, tax rates uh, from some other paper and the growth rate uh, from from the Penn World tables, um, and uh, calibrated the model elsewhere. And here's sort of what you get. Um, and so the point here is that. This is again, the left hand side is again the first, from the first slide I had an in introduction. So the blue line is uh, the survey of consumer finances data. Um, the dashed line is um, Gabrielle's data. And the green line is the model um, where uh, the idea is that you feed in the uh, increase in R minus G observed in the data. Okay? And the point here is that, again, the model sort of fails miserably. Okay? Um, so this and in, in, in response to this increase in R minus G. In fact, um, so it, 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 cannot even, it cannot even generate the relatively modest increase in top inequality, top wealth inequality seen in the survey of consumer finances and has no chance of getting the very fast r uh, rise in top wealth inequality seen in uh, Gabrielle's data, okay? Um, and the point here is that you need something else than an increase in R minus G to drive this. The idea is just that, uh, this R minus G triggers these like very long run dynamics, which are just way too slow to to explain what we actually saw in the data. Okay, just to very briefly mention it. So then we sort of uh, ask again, like, so how can you sort of fix up the story, or what other alternative economic theories can give you a fast rise in top top wealth inequality? And uh, the what you really need is 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 not that this R minus G story, this capital tax story, but what you need is something that the like the rate of return of the super wealthy. Um, relative to the just wealthy sort of increased a lot, okay? Um, so you don't get that out of a simple sort of tax story. You could get it out of a sort of more complicated story. So maybe it's the case that richer people are, uh, get better investment advice and that's gotten more extreme over time. Or maybe it's the case that they're better at taking advantage of sort of tax loopholes, these kinds of things. Another thing that could give you this, and Gabrielle sort of showed some evidence for this, is uh, that the savings rates of the super wealthy relative to the wealthy, so the 0.01% relative to the top 1%, say, have uh, increased over time. So that could, again, give you a fast increase in, in top inequality. But what cannot give it to you is sort of this, uh, this R minus G story. Okay, so let me then just conclude very briefly. So from a theoretical point of view, the, the main point of this, the, the main theoretical result was that the transition dynamics in sort of the uh, big class of standard theories of top income and wealth inequality are an order of magnitude too slow relative to the data. Um, and when we sort of uh, use these results to uh, rule in a bunch of stories and rule out a bunch of stories. Okay, thanks very much. That's it.